So I've been a magazine photographer for uh, just under 30 years. Uh, I started as a photojournalist in uh, California. And uh, I grew up in Southern California. And in some way, I kind of feel that uh, my dad, who is not a photographer, who is a welder, his photograph of the Apollo 11 launch may very well have ignited uh, my lifelong passion for photography. Many people feel that when they experience, they, they experience a moment firsthand, there's a real clear anchor to that point in time. And we have this paradigm of that experience that, that lives with us. After that launch took place for the next several days, humankind would be united as a species. And my dad realized that this was a significant moment. So much so that he got our camera off the shelf, the family camera, dusted it off, and he had it at the ready to take a picture of the launch off the TV screen. This thing starts to lift off the pad, and I remember the distinct pop of the flash bulb. My dad took that picture, and it's, it's really cemented in my memory. Sent the film to the pharmacy, the local pharmacy. Film came back, and we had this perfect photograph of our TV set. <laughs> The flash bulb had obviously washed out the image on the screen. <laughs> Hence, my dad's career as a welder really burgeoned after that. And I was incredibly disappointed. I remember I was so disappointed. But now, to me, it's, almost, it's like almost a religious relic to me. Like, it takes me there. Apollo 15, 1971, Dave Scott was the mission commander. This was the first mission that NASA specifically trained the astronauts to be geologists and observers. And really used their learned expertise to try to communicate back to the scientists on the ground what they were seeing. NASA, in its infinite wisdom and, and incredible precaution, decided they wanted to land at a, at a region called Marius Hills, which is really similar in terrain to the Apollo 11, 12, and 14 landing sites. Basically a really safe, flat surface, kind of a lunar desert. On the other hand, the geologists wanted to land at a location called Hadley. Hadley Crater, Hadley Rill. It's a very, very rugged region at the base of the Apennine Mountains, which you see here. They're sometimes referred to as the Lunar Himalayas. They're massive mountains. And of course, the geologists on Earth, they, they want to know what's there, what's there. They pushed for the Apennines. NASA pushed for Marius. There was a stalemate that was reached, and there's kind of a legendary meeting that took place where it's like, you know, we're sequestering ourselves into this room until we decide where we're going to land. Everybody weighed in, stalemate, Right at the end of the meeting, Dave Scott, mission commander, gave his opinion on it. Dave said that landing at Hadley will be trickier, but I'm confident that we can land at either site. From what I've learned in the field, the Hadley Apennine site, with its complex variety of features, both impact and volcanic, is the best choice for putting together a picture of how the moon came to be. It will be a little riskier, but the Apennines have something else. They have grandeur. And I believe there's something to be said for exploring in beautiful places. It's good for the spirit. And I'm going to start crying. Hold on. So I like American Idol auditions. I'm like on the floor in fetal <laughs> position. <laughs> so <laughs> the thing I find beautiful about that is, you know, leading up until that point, astronauts were really test pilots. They were fighter pilots. They were engineers. They were button pushers. They were working the problem regardless of what was going on. And NASA started to try to push the astronauts into sort of a more poetic phase of exploration. They wanted the kind of spirit of the mission to come out. They, they really, really pushed for that. There, Alan Bean was sketching on the moon. You know, there was a great quote by Pete Conrad where, uh, where um, Al Bean said, look up, look at the Earth, look, you know, it's an Earth rise, look at the Earth rise. And Pete Conrad said, who was the consummate engineer, test pilot, fighter pilot. He said, ah, oh, you've seen one Earth, you've seen them all. So we've got, <laughs> that was Apollo 12, and by 15 we had Dave Scott talking about grandeur and spirit, which I, I always found was really beautiful. So in 1972, Gene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt were on the lunar surface, and NASA sent them a radio communication. The Congress had just approved funding for the construction of the next generation of space exploration vehicles. It's called the Space Transportation System, but it quickly became known as the Space Shuttle. Early on, it became apparent that the model had its limitations. It had flaws. It would ultimately be wrought with budget overages. Uh, you know, in its 30-year career, endured tragedies and triumphs. And so in 2011, NASA announced that there are three orbiters left. 
We have missions for all three of those. Each one of them gets a last launch and it's over. Growing up in that space period and that space age and space race, you know, everything was space, you know, Tang, I remember loving Tang and all the things that came out of the space program sideways. So when they made this announcement, I felt, initially I felt this jab and I thought, my God, I'd been to a couple launches. You know, what it takes, the violence that it takes to sort of like escape, you know, the earth. It's, it's a really profound thing. So I got this idea. My wife actually had the idea, I think, but I'm going to claim it for now because she's not miked. Uh, that, <laughs> that I would go and I would document the last three launches, the last three orbiters. So I went about designing a way to shoot the launches. There's so much infrastructure involved in just getting this thing to work. I wanted to photograph the result of this incredible effort. So I decided to photograph the infrastructure, the buildings, the hardware, the vessel. They're beautiful to look at. They're battle scarred. They're patched. You know, I went under one of the shuttles and the thing had patches everywhere, all over it. You know, you could just tell it had just been through hell, really, on re-entry. I went in the vehicles. They, there was a sacredness to the inside of the vehicles. All the shuttle interiors and the ancillary stuff and the processing and the spacesuit processing stuff. All of the engine processing. Fascinating. I mean, these are industries in and of themselves. These are space M&Ms, which I actually really liked. It's the old mission control from the Apollo era, which actually up until 96 worked on the shuttle program. So this all came together in, in a book that I released in 2012 called Last Launch. It's my third book, and it just is a chronicle of this, of this program. The only person that appears in the book is this man walking down the ramp away from pad 39A, which amazingly is the same pad that the Apollo 11 launch took place. So photographing the launches themselves, this is a logistics thing. Like, how do you do this? You know, the shuttle's basically in two minutes is completely out of sight. And I want to compress that into images. And I want to, I want to be able to expand that time. So this, uh, this is the shuttle actually on the pad. This is similar. This, this black part right here is the flame trench. So you see these huge solid rocket boosters here. When the, they ignite, fire comes down through the pad into the flame trench. And it's, it goes through this big port. And there are these nozzles, which is really interesting. These are all water nozzles. And just prior to the engine start, they drop millions of gallons of water down into the flame trench because the sound pressure wave from the shuttle engines igniting and the vibration would just sh rattle the thing apart. So they use the water for sound suppression. And it also immediately vaporizes. So it, 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 it adds to the big show of this, you know, part of what you see is steam, you know, and part of what you see is smoke. So overcoming those technical difficulties, especially with regards to getting the cameras to start firing, you know, the closest any spectator can be to the launch site is three miles. And I said, well, how close do you guys view it from? You know, I wanna, I wanna be there. I don't wanna be with all the yahoos at the press side. I wanna be with you guys, you know? And they said, three miles. Like, that's how close we get to the launch. And I just thought, this is ridiculous. But, you know, in order to document the thing I wanted to, the cameras had to be very close to the vehicle. So I had an electrical engineer build me these sound triggers that would work within the parameters of the assignment. And as soon as the sound from the engines firing started, cameras started firing. So what I had to do is I had to figure out, like, what images I'm making. I'm not just going to randomly set up a bunch of cameras, right? I, I want to document this thing as a story. So I'd storyboard each launch, and I'd figure out what camera, where it would be placed, the focal length, place where it would be, number the camera. And I laid out all the boards before I'd start setting cameras. So I know what the shuttle does. I know what it does. It goes up. It rolls. It's, it's, it's very calculated every time. So I know I can compose frames that are going to yield images that are strong. I just don't want to be repeating myself. So this is the press site. This is the old uh, launch clock from the Apollo era, kind of a relic of that era. And this is how far away I am from the actual launch. So this right here is the launch tower. And that's, here's, here's this bay, and here's our clock, and there's the tower. And literally the first time I thought, this is ridiculous, look how far away I am, this is not gonna be cool. It could not be any further from not cool. I consciously didn't photograph any landings. It was all about this gesture, you know, this grand gesture. You know, to me a landing was, it was almost like, Landings are kind of bittersweet. You know, you're happy the vehicle returned with the payload and the experience that was had by all aboard. But there's something about the grandeur that we talked about earlier that, that was so such an expre expression of optimism for me. So here we go.
two minutes into the flight, it's, uh, 44 miles downrange. At the tip of that smoke column, you can just see the engines just as they're ready to burn out. This is Atlantis. I love this angle for the shuttle. I, I call it her sexy angle. I just, I really like that angle for her. It's all the ice. You see all the ice falling down off the tank from the liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen. These are always tricky to set the frames for because you know, I'll, I'll set the frame at the pad and then just tilt up to the sky and lock the camera off, set the focus and walk away from it. It's very unsettling to look through a camera lens and all there is is sky, this Atlantis. I was also really fortunate that for the three last launches I had three different types of weather. So I got some very distinct looking, unique images from each launch. This is one of NASA's helicopters that they fly around during the launch just to watch things. That's the column. That big long black shadow up on the top there is the ceiling of the clouds. That's the shadow cast by the column on the clouds. I always love that. Everything's just so big. It's audacious. You know, I think uh, Charlie Duke of Apollo, he said, look, I don't even understand how this thing works. I know my part of it. I know my part of it. This is audacious that we'd even try this thing, but I can tell you what, it's not going to fail because of me. I know how to do my part of this thing. And I love that. I love how optimistic that is. You know, it's just this belief, it's this faith that these thousands of people, thousands of people that have been working on this thing have all put their piece into it. And it's just this, it's, there's such a beauty to it. There's a great Neil Armstrong quote, which is, uh, mystery creates wonder and wonder is man's desire to understand. And I thought this really, uh, this really wrapped it up. So thanks very much.